Welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Barbara Myers. On any given day, it's estimated that about 70,000 inmates in U.S. prisons are psychotic. Anywhere from 200 to 300,000 male and female prison inmates suffer from mental disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depression. Prisons hold three times more people with mental illnesses than do psychiatric hospitals, and U.S. Prison, prisoners have rates of mental illness that are up to four times higher than the general population. These are the findings by a report by Human Rights Watch, released in 2003. Here today to talk to us about prisons and mental health are two people who have seen how the system works from the ground up. DeWitt Buckingham is someone who had a mental illness and who was in prison. He now works at being a mentor to youth and a director of Black Men Speakers Bureau in Oakland that seeks to urge people to get mental health care when they need it. DeWitt is active in mental health consumer activities in Alameda County. Welcome, DeWitt. Thank you. Our next guest is Reverend Nick Ristad, who is the Protestant chaplain at Napa State Hospital, which is largely a facility for mentally ill prisoners. He previously was chap chaplain at the state prison in Vacaville. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is to start with you, Dewitt, and have you tell us your story in your own words, like where did you grow up and what were some of the circumstances? I grew up in Berkeley. I went to school, Longfellow Burbank in Berkeley, I. And it seems like I got in trouble every time I went to Oakland. You know, as long as I was in Berkeley, I was safe. But I always got in trouble when I went to Oakland. And what I found out was that I suffered from major depression. Now, this I didn't know. I always knew there was something wrong, but I just didn't know what. And I suffered from major depression. I was depressed and paranoid. And thank a loving God, I soon got some medication for my problem that works, and that was about seven years ago. How did you handle that, your mental health before you were able to get medication seven years ago? Very poorly. I used a lot of alcohol. I used a lot of drugs. I tried anything that came down the track. All you had to tell me was that try this and it'll make you feel good. Mm. And I'd jump on it with both hands and both feet. And what it did was got me in a jackpot, you know. And when the drugs ran out and the booze ran out and I ran out of money, that's when I get in trouble. Do you think that your mental health problem contributed to the reason why you were in prison? And now I know it did. You know, I always had thoughts about, you know, why am I feeling like this? Why am I thinking like this? Mm -hmm. But now I know I got some help and it really worked. And I am so grateful. Right. I got the correct medication and the correct doctor that explained to me that I wasn't a bad guy. I just had a chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. And when they gave me the medication, it worked. When you went to prison, what kind of treatment did you have in prison for your mental health problem? It was real close to next to none. You know, they just load you up with pills and heavily sedate you so you're not a problem. Okay. And then they turn you loose. Because I had stopped washing my face, brushing my teeth, mm -hmm. combing my hair. And my friends said, man, we got to get you off of that medication. Oh. And thank God for my buddies, because yeah. I was lost yeah. and going down slope. So your friends helped you find the, the right kind of uh, doctor to help you? Yeah, well, no, they just told the doctor that I wasn't going to take that medicine, <laughs> and he better not tell. <laughs> <laughs> so how long were you in prison? A total of nine years. I mm -hmm. did three years the first time I had a robbery with violence. And I did six years the second time. I had a second-degree murder with 
use of a firearm. And I always got out early because I could function in prison. And I always wanted to work. And I wanted to get out of that cell as fast as I could. So when they had the first unlock in the morning, I came out like a jumping jack, you know. And I didn't go in until the last lockup, you know. Where was it that you were in prison? Jamestown, Soledad, Vacaville, San Quentin, and back in the 60s in CRC. Wow. Yeah, wow. California Rehabilitation Center. Okay. They moved me around because yeah. I had issues, okay. you know, and didn't know how to deal with them except get drunk. So what kept you going under these really difficult circumstances? I tell, tell you honestly, I survived on hate. Hate. Yeah, H-A-T-E. Mm. As long as I was mad, as long as I was hateful, my adrenaline flowed, I could feel my body, I wouldn't let anything stop me. And Oh, I thank a loving God that I don't have to walk around like that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, just constantly, constantly mad. I was going to ask you what kind of special challenges people who are both in prison and also have mental illness, do they have special challenges that prisoners who aren't mentally ill? You know, when I was in prison, they had a special unit mm -hmm. where they used to house a lot of people that had serious mental challenges. Mm -hmm. But guys like me, and matter of fact, all the guys in my wing, we had mental challenges that they didn't consider serious. So they'd give us the pills off the pill cart. Mm -hmm. But it was serious. And if I had only been treated appropriately, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have ever gone back. But the solution then was heavy medication, mm -hmm. and he won't be a problem. Mm -hmm. And they were right. Fall asleep every time he stopped. Do you see that that kind of a situation at Napa, where people are heavily medicated to keep? No, not so much anymore. It used to be years and years ago. Yeah, okay. not so much anymore. They're, they, uh, I think, have discovered better medications mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so they're and they're more judicious they have more protocols that they have to go through to change oh, uh, medications and the staff is, is much more sensitive oh, that's good to this to kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, particularly because we were a mental hospital before mm -hmm. we became a uh, forensic and yeah. criminal for, for the criminal insane do it what do you do now to keep yourself mentally healthy I truly try to read as much literature as I can. I go to as many meetings as I can. I still believe in group therapy, and I attend a lot of 12-step meetings. It's the thing that keeps me in touch with my disease and allows me to speak to somebody that knows me when I'm in a bad space. You know, I'm thankful for the men that have taken the challenge to work with me. Because I came in wearing bandanas and my cap backward and them dark, dark glasses. And mm. yeah, and I'd scare most people away from me. <laughs> you know, but uh, today I go to 12 step meetings and group therapy. And I got a very good psychiatrist. I wanted to ask you about your mentorship program with youth, particularly African-American youth in Oakland. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. I am the founder and the CEO of a nonprofit called New Dynamic Hope Project. I work with transitional age youth. Mm -hmm. But living here in Oakland, I had to lower the age generally is from 17 to 25. Mm -hmm. Well, what I've discovered is sometimes that's too long. So I had to lower it down to 14 oh. to 25 to try to catch them before they get in that rut. Mm -hmm. You know, because unfortunately, they're not hearing anything positive. 
they're around their families and the family could have a lot of negative stuff on it and they hang around with their friends who we all know have a lot of negative stuff on them they don't have positive role models and I tell people I said you know what these youngsters need is not somebody like Reggie Jackson they need somebody they can touch mm -hmm. say okay I can touch him when he talks to me I can feel him mm -hmm. and that's what I try to do but I got an eight-week program it begins with developing a comfort zone that we can all talk in together and I finish it with rites of passage saying now you know you're gonna be a man mm. yeah that's and they great. like that they really like that that's yeah. great yeah it makes me feel good too yeah so you and you've been doing this for some years right yeah i've been a sponsor for over 20 years wow. but now that i'm retired mm -hmm. you know i can go into this you know full force and i enjoy it i enjoy it the only thing i don't enjoy is when i see some that I know aren't bad fellas, but they get caught up in the trap, and next thing you know, they're calling me from jail, mm -hmm. and that's pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. You know, it really is. But you can probably see some that don't get into that. I'm watching a lot lose, and my girlfriend's son, who I was working with, got shot, and because he got a new girlfriend and the old boyfriend didn't want to let her go hmm. so they shot him oh. and he died 21 days later hmm. and i keep a picture of him at my house because hopefully one day when i can get my own building like this uh -huh. i'm gonna have a big blow up of him his name was diamond jackson and he wasn't a bad boy uh -huh. he hung out with bad people uh -huh. And that's what I have to work at, too. That's really impressive that you have created that organization and helped so many people. And not only that, but I know you're the head of, of an organization that called Black Men Speak. Can you tell us what that is? Yes. Black Men Speak was another organization that I founded that works through the PLCC. Pool of Consumer Champions. Yeah, Pool of Consumer Champions for Alameda County. Mm -hmm. And what was happening was they kept saying that we had been over, like we were overpaid, we were overdone, that the black men in these programs, we've done enough for you guys. And mm -hmm. I said, what you did was you answered your own questions, but you never asked us what were our questions. Mm -hmm. So I said we were in, inappropriately served. Mm -hmm. You know, right. you missed. Mm -hmm. You know, you missed the target. So what we did was I got a group of guys together, and each one of us tells our story. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I tell the story that brings the most heat because I, I go someplace the black folks don't want to go because I tell them about incest. Mm -hmm. My second wife was incested when she was a very young girl. My sister was molested by our oldest brother. Mm. And my cousin had a child for her father. Mm. And nobody wants to talk about that. Mm. But I do. Because it just doesn't have to happen. Right. But I got to be able to comfort those people and tell them, you know what, it'll never happen again. Because every time we start getting down to where the rubber meets the road, tears start flowing like Niagara Falls. Yeah. And it's men and women. Yeah. You know, it's rough. Yeah. But I'm not going to stop. What would you advise someone to do uh, who's been in prison and has, has a mental health problem? Right at the beginning, I would tell them that you know you need to find an organization of your choosing that will give you the help that you need and you're comfortable in talking with these people. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not comfortable talking with them, you're not going to say much. 
you know, and nothing's going to happen. But I always try to say, you know what, we can change. Mm -hmm. We can change, but it's going to take some effort. Mm -hmm. It's really going to take some effort. What can family members do on behalf of their loved ones who are in prison? Support them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come and visit. Yes. Write letters, call up. Yes. Um, they need that support mm -hmm. because when you start being heavily sedated and you get no letters, you get no visits, they just set you aside mm -hmm. and don't worry about you. Mm -hmm. But if you get letters and you get visits, you know, they can't just do anything to you, mm -hmm. you know, because your family will start squawking, mm -hmm. you know, and I am so glad that my wife at the time supported me because mm -hmm. for a long time I didn't think I'd ever get out. You know, I was up under the indeterminate sentence in law mm -hmm. and I just didn't think mm -hmm. that I'd get out. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be here for the rest of my life. A very impressive um, turnaround. Um, I feel really. no good about it. Well, really. you should. <laughs> I'm really impressed by the yeah. stories you're telling. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about Napa State Mental Hospital, you know, how many prisoners, the kind of offenses mm -hmm. and the mental disorders and so forth. The, uh, it's for men and women. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's probably 25% women and mm -hmm. the rest men. There's uh, 1,250 people there, approximately 1,000 of them are inside the prison area, and the uh, 250 are uh, mental health residents, and, uh, which is considered a mental, mental health hospital. Uh, the residents inside the, uh, my parishioners inside the uh, mm -hmm. prison are there for all kinds of different uh, crimes in the same way they would be in Vacaville or, mm -hmm. or any place else. And many of them commit their crimes uh, uh, under delusional kind of circumstances or mm -hmm. high stress, you know, really high stress. Mm -hmm. uh, mental illness is um, much more common than most people think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, thank God, hopefully the new med medical mm -hmm. bill is, is now going to address that the same way it addresses mm -hmm. colds and, and everything else so that people will feel hopefully... Uh, less uh, stigmatized by it and more willing to get help and people that are uh, their family or their uh, friends who see this will have a better idea where to go and so it'll educate the whole community mm -hmm. about mental illness. I mean, I would, I would suspect that almost all of us at one time or other have had some serious mental problems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we've handled it by self-medication or we've handled it by going talking to friends or we've reclused ourselves and locked ourselves away for whatever amount of time uh, we needed. Uh, because uh, we take colds as, as, you know, somebody gets a cold. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can get to that point in society where mm -hmm. mental illness is something we recognize, you know, is happening. And you can self-recognize it yourself rather than saying, what's happening to me? You say, oh, I'm... I'm really not functioning very well. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not getting up in the morning or I'm drinking too much or, or whatever. Or somebody says to you, you know, you're, you're not functioning very well and, and we'll get you some help. And, right. and you say, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll get some help. Like somebody would say, well, you better go to the doctor. Yeah. You know, and they say, oh, yeah, there's no stigma with that. They say, oh, yeah, okay, I better go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, why are prisoners sent to Napa State Hospital? Uh, prisoners come to Napa State Hospital from two places. They come from the prison system. Uh, the, uh, Vacaville used to be a prison mental hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, under uh, uh, one of our former governors, he decided the prison system was no longer going to coddle people. And so he turned the hospital into a straight prison and just sent all the other people were sent out to the to the uh, prison system itself. And, of course, uh, the prison system wasn't used to that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know how to handle these people. And these people caused problems. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have psychiatrists in all these places. And so then there was a lot of, and you know, they don't 
function the way normal prisoners do. So they don't follow procedures, they don't obey the rules, and they get uh, uh, preyed on by some of the other prisoners because they can't defend themselves or they don't know what's going on. Right. And uh, so uh, from 19, uh, about 81 till 19, 19, 1997 uh, was when they started sending them to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we uh, started taking them. The other, the, the other uh, place they come from is they come from uh, the courts. Mm -hmm. They plead guilty by reason of insanity or it's very clear when they come that they mm -hmm. can't defend themselves and the lawyers say, you know, they can't. Mm -hmm. They don't know what's going on here, so we have to mm -hmm. have to do something. So they come to us mm -hmm. for uh, re to be returned to sanity. And uh, uh, they go through a program of uh, medication, a program of therapy, mm -hmm. uh, kind of rehabilitation to then go back to the mm -hmm. courts. What kind of things do you do with the prisoners? Um, basically, I visit with them. I'll go on a unit mm -hmm. and walk around, and they all know who I am, and they'll come and talk to me. Or the unit will call me mm -hmm. and say, we have a person who wants to see the Protestant chapel. Would you please come over? And I go over and talk with them. Mm -hmm. And they have the, the same kind of needs that you and I have. You know, they're mm -hmm. angry or upset or feeling lonely or have questions about God. Does God really love me? Why is God doing this mm -hmm. to me? Those mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, those are very real serious questions, right. particularly when you're ill and you can't figure things out well. Uh, so I, have, I, I do that kind of counseling. And I also train in, interns that come from the seminaries in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, from all the different seminaries, Catholic, Protestant. Uh, I've had Jewish uh, seminaries come, uh, seminarians come. And they, they come and they usually are there for 10 full weeks. They're there five days a week, mm -hmm. Sunday through Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, and they go out in the, on the units and then they come back and report what they're doing and, and they're really excited about what they see and, and the response mm -hmm. that they get from the residents, mm -hmm. from our parishioners that are just very yeah. welcoming to them and, right. and hospitable. The religious faith can be such an important part oh, of yeah. healing. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and some people, uh, you know, who aren't familiar, in this day and age when we have such a secularized society, there's a lot of people who don't recognize religion as being worth anything, right. you know. And so that uh, discrimination, then, is some, sometimes we have to deal with that, uh, you know, not only with the, with the residents, but also with the staff sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally, uh, people are very welcoming and very encouraging and very helpful mm -hmm. uh, and want to... Wanna, and then also I have services. Mm -hmm. I have three Sunday services. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then uh, my resident, uh, my uh, interns, uh, then they develop services and in, in group uh, uh, Bible studies right. and prayer groups, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That's really so. impressive. Mm -hmm. I'm going to need to move on and address those of you in the audience and ask you whether or not you know anyone who is struggling with mental health and is a prisoner or has been a prisoner. And if so, I'd like you to think about what you've learned in this program from DeWitt and from Nick. The main messages you want to give you are that mentally ill prisoners are human beings like anyone else. They deserve adequate medical care. They can return to positive roles in life. They can help each other. Religious faith can be a tremendous help. Being open about mental illness can cut, could cut down on crime, and young men need positive role models, and they're getting them. And then I'd like you to think about this and then decide what you can do or what you might recommend to these people that might help them. So that's your assignment. Mm -hmm. For resources, I'd like to give you the contact information for Jewett Buckingham and his two organizations, Black Men Speak, and New Dynamic Hope Project. Uh, phone number 510-698-4894 on your screen.
I'd also like to tell you sort of a general reference, Beslan Center for Mental Health Law. The URL for that is on your screen. It has lots of good information about mental health and legal issues. For SRS organizations in the community, there's 12 step programs Narcotics Anonymous, Alcohol Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous. Been very helpful to people. There's also an organization called the East Oakland Recovery Center, which helps a lot of people recover from mental health and, and substance abuse difficulties. All of those places are things that you can check out. So I'd like to thank you, DeWitt, and thank you, Nick, for being on the show. And I'll close with these words from the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear. And the stakes are very high. Take courage. For deep down, there's another truth. You are not alone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.